Big Footy Port Adelaide podcast is proudly sponsored by New Vision. My team, Kanda, power. I love the power. power, power. I love the power. power, power. Hi everyone and a big welcome back to the Big Footy Port Adelaide podcast, a show about all things Port Adelaide Footy Club. I am Macca19, and I'll be hosting this podcast again in 2015. And joining me as co-host, as always, we got Fishing Rick. Well, hey, Macca, you sound very sprightly. Must be the Mate, first, first episode of the year. You little ripper. Well, oh, man, it's like yesterday we stopped. I know. Bring it on. Rock on. And look, we thought we'd start the season with a bang and uh, bring out the big guns. So we're speaking with forum favourite, Triby. Guys, how are we? Mate, oh, the biggest how do we enjoy the off season so far? Pretty good. I had catch- a good time this off season. I yeah. watched bugger all football, had a bit of a break, and uh, spent a lot of time with the family. It was pretty good. Beautiful. Watched a uh, bit of cricket, a bit of soccer. It's all good. Just like okay. everyone else, that's pretty much fabulous. So, are you guys happy with the uh, the Asian Cup soccer result? Oh, it was pretty inevitable. I would have thought. Really? Mm. Yeah. I thought we might have choked it just before the final. Uh, we should be winning that competition. I thought Japan was the only threat, and once they were knocked out, it was a uh, it was pretty uh, rudimentary that we'd take it out. Yeah. And are you guys excited yes. about the Cricket World Cup? No. Up? Not overly. No. 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 And what about the footy preseason? Are you excited about that, mate? Bring it on. Get <laughs> yes. it started. It is. It's getting Just get exciting. into it. Yes, not far away. That's it. <laughs> well, Rick, how was your off-season, mate? Yeah, hectic. Macca, very hectic, but not too bad. We um, uh, had a nice Christmas break, and and then obviously, as a lot of you guys know, we uh, we got a bit hot there just after. Um, after New Year's, and uh, it was pretty chaotic, and it's still chaotic now. The residual flow on effects one month later. Yep. So, how close did it actually come to your house? Uh, two meters. Two meters. Two meters. We had some. Jesus. We had some ember burns on our actual decking, and we built the house in. 2011, and one of the requirements was that we we had to make the house um, hardwood because we wanted a wooden house, and the decking had to be hardwood as well. And eventually, or ultimately, that probably saved um, saved our house from burning down. Our our neighbour, 100 metres away, unfortunately lost his house, and um, I've got to say the the whole fire ex- experience is for people that have to go through it, is as traumatic as, as what you hear from the stories. We, um, so on the, uh, on the Saturday, I'm trying to get my timeline of events here. So what happened on the Friday, we, left, we let the kids go home from the York Peninsula early because our kids can drive and they wanted to go back home. So we sent them off home and then at about 12 o'clock that day, I, I walked out out the front and had a look across the golf and there was this massive mushroom cloud sort of in our general direction because we obviously we could see right across and I said to Mel, oh, shit, that doesn't look good. What's going on over there? And, and so we had a quick look up on the internet and there was a fire at Sampson's Flat and it said that Township of Kersbrook could be in trouble. So I called my son and he said, yeah, we, we just got home. I said, what are you doing? He said, yeah, I'm out in the paddock. And I said, oh, can you see the smoke? And he said, yeah, I can see the smoke. And, and, uh, so, and he goes, oh, I can see flames as well. And I, <laughs> mate, I said, mate, get in the car and uh, carefully come back, pick up your, your sister, your brother and your cousin who were all there and, um, and go to my sister's place at Oak Bank. And my neighbour spoke to me just before that and he'd evacuated. Uh, I spoke to my other neighbour and they were just evacuating. And uh, so we quickly scrambled back, got our kids, and we actually went back home at nine o'clock and, uh, at that night. And we had a look, and the, the whole hill, um, the western side above Kersbrook, was just one red glow. It looked apocalyptic. Um, and I said to Mel, we're not staying. We didn't have enough water uh, to try and fight it. And then Saturdays, when it obviously went out of control, gum went under ember attack. 
we got all these text messages from concerned friends and family um, about um, the fire and where it was and we are trying to work out how everyone knew this and and so uh, we worked out that they were listening to the scanner app on, on the uh, application so we download it, we had to drive to Ardrossan to get bloody reception as you know reception at my place Mac is pretty crap over there yep. and uh, so we're listening in the car on the scanner app about half an hour in, Mel goes, oh, they're not really saying anything. All they were saying was grass fire on Checker Hill Road. So we'll, I just started the car uh, with the scanner app on and then this CFS firefighter came over the scanner saying, uh, 303's burnt down and we're 303A. And we're yeah. like, Mel starts crying and we were like, oh, shit. Um, have they got the codes wrong? Have they, um, you know, is, if that house is gone... Is our house gone? And then they're on the scan. Go, oh, there's a massive explosion. We think it's coming from one of the sheds, and we're just like far out, man. Our um, our house has obviously gone down, burnt down. And then then they said we can't get to A and B, which is mine and my other neighbours. So we we didn't know after that if our houses were still intact. And and then um, so we I had to call my neighbour and tell them that their house had burnt down. And and then I was just really concerned ultimately. For, and the people around, the firefighters and my, and my livestock, to think that um, they could have been burned alive was just a horrendous thought for all of our animals. Our cat was there, our chooks were there. Um, and it's just the helplessness that you, you feel because you can't do anything. You're locked out. Um, my neighbour sort of busted in the side roads on Saturday night and he was great. He, he sort of helped us numerous times, telling us over the phone he was putting out spot fires on our property and uh, yeah, the the fire it was a fireball that just came up the hill, took out our neighbour's house, and and we're very lucky. And every every single person that's come here uh, to our house has looked at it and gone, "How the hell is your house not burnt down?" And I said, "I've got no idea." Um, but divine it's intense. It, yeah, it was. It was very intense. And and yeah, so I spoke to Port, and they were keen to do the community clinic up there. So uh, uh, spoke to James Wakeland and. Uh, Brad Ebert was keen to, to come up and have a look and really get an understanding of what was going on up there. So took the Port Boys up for a drive through the, uh, the Checker Hill Road region and uh, gave them a bit of a tour of uh, the devastation. And, yeah, it was, you know, Brad was very, all the boys were very sincere for the impact it's had on uh, all the community up there. And I guess they didn't realise, because you don't, I guess you don't appreciate it on TV, um, but they didn't realise the extreme nature of the fire until you're actually there and I don't know if you guys have been through there but it's devastation all right let's get into it and talk about Port Adelaide um we'll start with the positive first and and talk about a re-signing that happened over the off season in Jackie Homsch one of our young key defenders he's uh, signed until the end of 2017 such a great defender and had a huge breakthrough year in 2014 played 24 games still only 21 he's just got a match, massive future ahead of him it does. But uh, where was he going to go? Detroit? I mean, Jack Homsch is a local boy. We've got him back from GWS. He looks set to play 200 games. So, I mean, it's a fabulous signing, but these are the ones that really, I mean, these are the default it's signings. the bread and butter. Oh, they're the default signings. Yeah. If, if you can't be locking down these guys, you've really got to question your existence as a factor in the Australian Football League, don't you, boys? Pretty much. Yes. But I'm a bit more excited. I think it's great that he signed. You never, it, nothing, there's no certainties in AFL football anymore, and it'd be quite easy to look at someone like Jack, and especially uh, our cross tail and rivals, rivals, and and try and pinch a, a player. And uh, but I'm with you, Tribe. At the same time, I don't think he was ever going to go anywhere else. And the earlier we get signings, the better for my liking. It's uh, it's much more. Um, What's the word? I was going to say much more stressful, but it's a lot less stressful when people were signing on at a lot earlier period of time. Look, he's got everything to become a, a very, very good, very consistent AFL player. He's got the closing speed, the defensive ability. He's got great skills. You know, he's got everything, and I expect him to become, you know, one of those sort of elite defenders over the next sort of three, four, five years. Absolutely. I mean, he reads the play. He's so big and strong and, you know, brave too. Like, um... As part of that heartbreaking prelim final loss, sorry to bring it up, boys, but uh, you know a lot, a lot, a lot was made of Monfrey's mark and uh, you know uh, Tommy Jonas getting robbed 
by the umpire without holding the ball. But let's not forget, Jack Homsch looked like he'd seriously done himself a mischief about a quarter earlier when he had that collision uh, when Hawthorne were about four or five goals up and looked like he was really seriously hurt. So, yeah. um, you know, he's got that ability to go back with the flight. I mean, he's got a beautiful left foot. And what were GWS thinking, telling him he was too small? What was that about? They live to give to Port Adelaide, GWS. <laughs> they do. The front end, the back end, the middle end, they just love it. <laughs> that's it. Well, look, let's go on and talk about uh, a less than positive thing, and that's Daniel Flynn. He went home for Christmas and for the second year running didn't come back. Obviously, he came back last year, but uh, this year we've heard the reports last week that uh, he's told the club he's not going to come back at all this time. Uh, pretty disappointing. Very disappointing. I... I was a big fan of Flinny and, you know, I, I didn't mind, well, I didn't mind, but, you know, obviously I could understand what he went through last year and not coming back and I thought he really made a commitment to the club when he did come back and his, uh, his potential really intrigued me. But uh, to do it again, I really hope that, you know, as a club we just say, nah, all right, that's, that's it, mate. Because, you know, you don't want to keep chasing uh, someone and start coming across desperate, which, but it's really disappointing. Daniel Flynn's line-breaking speed across the MCG. I mean, you could just picture it, couldn't you? Oh, in a, absolutely. In a big yeah. game, even a, even, in a, even a big minor round game, on the wide expanses of the MCG, seeing him, you know, breaking lines and hitting targets. And, oh, it, it was just so tantalising. And you can see why the club tried so hard to get him back last year when it looked like he wasn't going to come back. But, yeah. you know, Collingwood lost Marty Clark after Marty Clark had made it. Like, Marty Clark was a seriously good halfback flanker for Collingwood when Collingwood yeah. were right up the top. And... You know, the, the pull factors from home are, are really big for a lot of these boys. I mean, you know, but I think you've got to flip the coin. I mean, we could have had another Pierce Hanley on our hands. He had every attribute to be a dominating player, but, you know, we'll never know now. That's it. You've, you've got to give you a chance, yourself a chance to, uh, to find these players. And we did that. And look, in the end, he's a teenager, and some people don't really want to be halfway across the rail from, uh, from their family and, and friends to pursue a career that... Uh, you know, may not even really turn out, but, you know, I thought he could have made it, but, you know, maybe we'll see him again in the future. Maybe it won't be with us. You never know. All right, another positive. Back to the positives. Um, we've got another sponsor, a premier partner in Oak Milks. Um, they're also going to be our bowl sponsor this year for 2015 as well. Look, quite simply, you can't spell boke without Oak, and so Oak sponsoring us is a match made in delicious milky heaven. Oh, my! how long do you work on that one for? Oh, at least 20 minutes. <laughs> the the sponsors are just rolling in and at the media um, what's the f- uh, photo session last week there was uh, a noticeable amount of uh, premium plus sponsors and I, I think there's optimism for uh, a few more as well so it's good to see that everyone's getting on the gravy chain and uh, and I don't mind I'm happy for them all to get on and hopefully they hang around yeah look I know we've had to take some uh, fairly big responsibility with uh, our attraction to sponsors and stuff like that. But let's be honest, um, compared to three or four years ago when we were a toxic brand and we had everybody local and nationally kicking us while we were down and we ended up with a couple of uh, horrible, horrible major sponsors, let alone uh, Mm. premier sponsors. I mean, now David Koch and Keith Thomas and all the guys behind the scenes, Kevin Osborne, Cos Cardone, I mean, they're clearly working their magic nationwide and Port Adelaide has become a really exciting brand. I mean, I think it's gone beyond a challenger brand. I think Port Adelaide's gone back to being a serious powerhouse. You know, we're tracking towards 55, 60,000 members. Adelaide Oval is a nationally, if not internationally renowned hub that attracts just awesome spectacles. And, you know, why wouldn't you want to get on board? Port Adelaide is a sexy brand. You know, as people have said with Renault, I mean, Renault did us a fantastic solid a couple of years ago when they came on board, but now we're getting to the point where we can really extract a really good mutually beneficial deal from each other. We'll get massive sums of money. Uh, our, our brands like Renault and Oak and all of them will get huge exposure on the national stage. I mean, this is just fantastic for all concerned. Yeah, Absolutely. Look, back to a, a bit of a negative again, and we'll talk about some injuries that we've had in the off-season. Um, Jackson Trengove, he's had some uh, shoulder surgery. Should be right to go early in the season. Um, Hamish Hartler's done a hamstring. Not a bad one, but he's uh, he's out for a few weeks. 
Um, and also Chad Wingard went in for a knee arthroscope and should be back uh, within about four or five weeks. Uh, no dramas. They'll always get a couple of injuries at this time of the year. Uh, I think, fingers crossed, if we're not getting any uh, season-ending injuries, we're doing very well. Um, yeah, so I saw Jacko uh, last Wednesday at a, uh, at a function and he was confident he'll be back and he's looking, he's still looking pretty fit even though his so- shoulder's a bit sore and um, and Burjo didn't seem to be too um, concerned either and yeah, you know, I mean, better to get it all cleaned up and, uh, and have it all sorted now so they, they come into the season with no injuries whatsoever. Yeah, just just give them anti gravity everything, don't you reckon? The anti gravity treadmill, <laughs> the anti gravity fire master. Let's just run through the wall. Mm. You know, I mean, our ability our ability to treat these guys. I mean, we know that um, Virgo and Maccas and our entire fitness and conditioning staff are fabulous. We've got excellent facilities down there. We have had for ten years, and we've finally got the staff to staff them. And now we've got the money through the Premiership Fund. I looked at it the other day, actually. Um, I think we got up to $13,000 per win last year. Wow. So nice. every one of those wins last year, that was an extra 13000 each time that went to Burgess and uh, all those guys to buy stuff for the club. So, um, you know, you've got, what, 40 players on a list. You've got to expect some attrition. And, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, exactly. We, we haven't had, like, you know, the days when Primus or Franco or one of these guys would go down, touch wood. So, um, you know, onward and upward. Mm. You'd rather it happen now than in uh, round one or round two, that's for oh, sure. absolutely. Well, we don't want Jacko going out for six weeks again, do we? We know what happened no. last time. No, definitely not. Look, back to the positives, and we've already touched on it a little bit, but uh, we'll talk about memberships. We cracked 50,000 members on the 16th of January a couple of weeks ago. Currently around about twelve to 13,000 ahead of where we were this time last year. I mean, it's just fantastic that this club is in such great demand. It's amazing. It, who would have thought two years ago, uh, that short time back, that we'd be in this position? I mean, the turnaround is just staggering, and that's what Triby was saying earlier. We're, we're on the way to becoming a, a juggernaut again, which is what we should be and always be. Um, you know, so it's fantastic for people to be jumping on or the loyal diehards coming back and they they renew their love with the club. I don't really care. Um, I just want people to embrace the club again and, and get sucked into the positive momentum that we've got. And I know that uh, we've got Ben coming on, Macca as well, from Port Adelaide to uh, chat about the membership shortly. Um, you know, and all the ticket sales are up, corporate sales are up. I don't think I'm talking out of school. Um, uh, Timmy G told me all the enclosed boxes on the eastern side are, are sold out. I think all the western boxes are sold. Um, corporate boxes, um, you know, they changed their pricing. They had to put some of it up, and the, I don't think that's deterred people. Um, but there's still some general admission available too, apparently. So there's still opportunities for people. But it's going to be a very healthy Port Adelaide Footy Club membership-wise this year. That's it. It's great to be in demand and have that sort of demand factor where people want and almost need tickets. I mean, it's fantastic compared to the fact a few years ago, I mean, you could just decide on the day whether you wanted to rock up or not. Yeah, I mean, you couldn't give tickets away, you know. Um, if you had a friend or a relative who couldn't go for whatever reason and you were stuck with the ticket, you couldn't you couldn't even find portmates who wanted to go because, I mean, between Amy Stadium and the, the side and, you know, we were on our bare bones, which then translated to the squad and then the wins and the losses and everything in between. I mean, it's just an amazing turnaround. And, um, you know, the, the thing I want to say is, all right, if you'd have asked me two years ago how we're going to go... I was saying to friends uh, when we were getting our seats that, you know, the way the stadium's going to be, we might be able to, if, you know, when Melbourne come here or Brisbane come here, well, we might be able to stand on the hill one day on a, on a, on a good day and have a beer from that angle or whatever. Mm. You wouldn't have known that uh, we'd be so subscribed that you've pretty much got to be locked into your seat as if it's a, as if it's a grand final now. And um, Thank God that the massive Port Adelaide nation has finally mobilised. They've always been there. Everybody knew 5, 10, 15, 20 Port supporters who identified as Port supporters who, you know, when's the last time they went to a game? Yep. They, they just didn't get out to Amy. And now Adelaide Oval, it's it's the absolute game changer. The central stadium, the neutrally branded stadium that feels like a home ground. You know, mass transit ser- um, serves it. You've got the bridge there. You've got all the bars and cafes. I mean, Adelaide... As we said after the first showdown, it, we've grown up, you know, and yep. 
Port Adelaide is the winner. I guess this segues into the next topic of discussion, Macca, which is the Adelaide Oval deal. But for all our for all our memberships and the glory that we can uh, uh, bask about at the moment, it, it still comes down to this deal at Adelaide Oval, which still isn't going anywhere. Um, to for the sake of the club to still be a healthy club in the competition. I mean, there's been some unconfirmed reports that they're getting pretty close to a deal, and we've heard that uh, we should have at least one million uplift uh, from this year's results. Um, there's going to be a review in five years. Obviously, we needed to come to the party as well and increase our membership um, cost, and we've done that, so we should make some more money from that, obviously. Um, but it's just ridiculous that, what, 18 months on from you know when Adelaide Oval, Adelaide Oval opened, um, we're still going through this. It should have been locked away by now. My word. It absolutely should have. I mean, at the end of the day, you've got the SRFL. They're now a cornered animal. Whether you could argue that Andrew Demetrio, as his last act as uh, AFL CEO, was to lure the SRFL out from their den or their cave. And uh, he did that successfully. They've done the 12-month review, and now it's obvious that the AFL, with Port Adelaide and the Adelaide Crows, uh, you know, they're out in the open and we're trying to get our fair wedge now because they don't have the affiliation agreement to hide behind. Now, they'll argue that, well, we never would have agreed to Adelaide Oval in the beginning if we'd have known that we were going to get shafted like this. But it's like, well, hang on a minute. You were killing the golden geese. There just has to be a fair return. Yeah. What well, I mean, as, as we've said on the boards, um, One Direction are going to be playing Amy Stadium. They're, they've still got this revenue stream. On top of AFL and SNFL football, why are we still talking about John Olsen and Lee Wicker trying to extract maximum wedge from AFL games? Well, I'm not, I'm not going to profess to being an Adelaide Oval expert in all of this. And obviously, there's a lot of people that know a truckload more than us and a lot of the information's kept closed. But I still think the government sort of let us down um, and really just jumped the gun and, and watered down our power and gave too much power to the SANFL once again. Um, that's my opinion on it anyway. I mean, the SANFL's got the cash cow of Amy Stadium where they're, they're going to get a truckload of money. Uh, so And they can still have governing rights of the, of the minor and community leagues. Um, that's something they can thrash out with the AFL. But why they had to have such control on the Adelaide Oval Stadium and still be the, the custodian, so to speak, of football in South Australia is, uh, is a mystery to me. We've got the power to win, power to roll, come on. For Adelaide aggression, we are the power from Port. Well, look, what we're going to do now is, uh, is preview the season for Port Adelaide We'll come up with some questions that we think need answering um, on how we're going to go this year, you know, what our expectations are and all that sort of stuff. Um, we might as well start with talking about the fixture. Um, as we know, it's a, it's a bloody hard fixture this year. Um, the weight of expectation is that we should be making finals. But even so, I mean, it's such a tough start to the season. We play Frio, Sydney, North, Hawthorne and the Crows in the first five weeks. I like the fixture. It's I brilliant. It's a- I mean, it's a great challenge. We've got good time slots, um, you know, national exposure. And, you know, if we're going to be the best, we have to beat the best, the, the old cliche. And, you know, we beat the Dockers away last year and at home. We beat uh, the Hawks at home. I like the exposure that we're going to get and I like the challenge. And if we're good enough, we should be uh, right up there in the top four once again. That's it. I think we'll know exactly where we stand pretty early in the season and, you know, I expect to win a lot of those games. I'd hope so. I'm going to have to go against the grain and say I really don't like it. I mean, I've got no problem with playing those fixtures. I just really don't like the way the AFL has somehow contrived to have them all in that first month. Yes. Because as, as top-level AFL has proven, you don't even have to play badly. You can play well. You can play really well and still get beaten because that's the nature of AFL football. I mean, you know, that I've got nightmares. I mean, North Melbourne at Etihad again in round three. What, what is that? I mean, I can just imagine like Chad Wingard's taking a mark in the goal square, the final siren's gone, and then as the ball is about to cross the line, the ball explodes and disappears and North Melbourne win because that is the luck that North Melbourne seemed to have against us every time. 
I mean, playing Fremantle at Subiaco for the third time in four weeks. Mm. What is that? At least we don't have to play at Geelong. But but I'd like to play at Geelong now. Really? Geelong are there for the taking. I'd love to go to Kidinia Park (laughs) and beat them at Kidinia Park. (laughs) That's why we don't go there anymore. (laughs) Exactly. that's right. The cyclist turn. We kept being sent there when we were awful. And now, Geelong, the wheel is turning. And we, we don't get to play them there where we could pick up a good away win. I mean... I don't know. We could easily go four and zero because we know we've got the talent. But I just I don't like the way that fixture has panned out. But when we're five and nil, I mean everyone's going to talk about how we're going to be the team to beat for the premiership and how fantastic it's going to be. And the run the run home is going to be not too bad. I mean the good thing is that it does open up straight after that, and the next seven games, you know, we really should be winning all seven. So it does open up, and you know, if we can have a great start to the season, then it should really set up our season as being, um, you know, almost a definite for top four and hopefully for top two. Well, look, let's talk about our list changes just uh, just briefly. Obviously, I'm, I guess the main players that went out of the side uh, or out of the squad this year, I mean, is uh, is Cassisi and Newton. They were the two that got the most games last year. Into the side, I mean, Ryder, just such a fantastic recruit, as we've talked about numerous times on this podcast. And uh, Nathan Cracker, you would think he has the ability to, to step in and, and perform a role at some point during the year. Love you, Dom. Yeah. Well, I think it's going to be a fantastic opportunity for Nathan Cracker. I mean, especially with Daniel Flynn not coming back. I think, uh, you know, I said at the start of the year when we saw him back at the Magpies that Cracker with that little bit of extra weight, had the ability to stand up in tackles and give himself that extra second to make better decisions rather than when he was a... Remember when he first came into the side? He was he had the talent, but he was raw and he was skinny and he maybe panicked in certain situations because I don't think he had that ability on the ball. But if he can keep developing at the Magpies and maybe an opportunity will open up where he could potentially become almost like a... not I don't want to say Peter Burgoyne in 07, but... Uh, almost like that halfback general that some of the uh, older sides like Sydney and uh, Hawthorne have that ability to move an older guy like Hodge or McVeigh back to just kind of command things when things are looking a bit dodgy. Maybe Cracker can step up and fill that role. Yep. What I love about the, the re-enlistment of Cracker is the maturity. I think uh, it shows a lot of maturity in the playing group where because they were asked about him coming back and and they, they were happy for him to come back. And also a Nathan to, you know, to really accept that he probably didn't handle things ideally from the club's perspective and and still came back and did the hard yards and was able to present himself. And I can see everything that you're talking about in Nathan uh, Triby as well as a player. And, look, uh, I think, it, yeah, maturity from all players and the club and I just think it's a great, it's a great addition and a no-brainer and... He's going to add a lot of value to our side this year, and it wouldn't surprise me if he gets some AFL games. He's good enough to be playing AFL. I remember seeing him at family day on that 65-degree family day <laughs> when it was just so hot. And I was sitting inside because, you know, the Irish-Scottish heritage, I don't take to heat at all well. And I was sitting at the table at the Port Club and in walked Nathan Cracker with his family. And he looked like a little bit of a deer in the headlights. Like, I think, he, you know, people recognise me. I haven't been here for umpteen years. But, you know, for him to go from that to, you know, playing for the Magpies, doing quite well for the Magpies and then being promoted to be a rookie with the power again is just a fantastic achievement. And, I mean, it's all in his hands. I mean, he'll need things to go his way. I mean, obviously, we don't want any long-term injuries because that obviously is pretty much going to be the only chance he'll have in the first 11 or 12 weeks of the season. But if an opportunity does arrive, I think he's far better placed to step up and add value than perhaps some of the other rookies that we've had in previous years. Yeah, it's a great story, and hopefully it's a fairy tale finish for him. It's a cracker of a story. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh geez. I'm going to but... ride that one all the way home. Oh. oh. <laughs> yeah. Not as good, but not far off. It was alright. Hashtag, why did that last bit happen? But <laughs> I, forgot, I just had to put that in there. I'm taking advantage of my good mic. Well, look, uh, to go with Ryder and Cracker, I mean, we've got a lot of second stringers um, coming through the system that haven't played a lot of footy, uh, but should play a part this year. Guys like Carl Amon have really impre- impressed in the preseason. Um, Mason Shaw, Tom Cleary should get games. Jared Redden, hopefully he can come back and 
actually play football at some standard. And uh, and Brendan Archie as well, you would expect to push for games this year. So do you think uh, Ryder and Angus Mumphreys might be out for a little while with this Asada investigation that can, continues to keep on giving? I don't know. I can't answer that question because I haven't really paid any attention to the Asada thing at all. I just got bored. Yeah, well, I'm bored too, but I do wonder if uh, something's still going to come out. And I'm going to be spewing if they do any of the players because I think it's grossly unfair to drag something on this long and uh, and then potentially impose penalties as it comes into the new season. I, I don't think that's fair on the players at all, especially now that we've got Paddy Ryder and he's going to be such a, a key player for us because he's tearing up a storm apparently. Look, I think it's clear that if penalties do come about, they're going to backdate it and they won't miss a lot of footy. Keep in mind they've already missed the final series. Like, that was over a season ago that they missed the final series. They were banned yeah. from the finals. I mean... This is true. You know, I think part of the problem, without wanting to delve too deep into Essen, is that I think the problem has been Heard and Little insisting on dragging this on. Yeah. I mean, was it the previous CEO wanted to be up front, accept the whack, and get on with it as quickly as possible, and then he was spilled because the board factions didn't like it and now it's just dragged on and on and on and now the players don't know what's going on the sooner that it's cleared and done and dusted and the boys can get on with their footy the better yep absolutely well look i'm going to ask some questions uh which i think are going to be the big questions of 2015 and we'll get some answers and and see how we're going to go this year the first one straight off the bat what is the expectation for 2015 make the grand final that would be nice uh, but at least at a minimum, uh, you know, finish in the top four again. Yeah. I think the expectation has to be top four. Um, I think the expectation has to be home prelim final and whatever happens from there happens. Yeah, I agree. Uh, has to be home prelim, doesn't it? Absolutely has to be a home prelim. If we don't get a home prelim, we're not serious. Come on. That's my Stephen Rowe. But, you know... <laughs> In all, in all seriousness, fellas, if we don't get a home prelim, it'll be pretty disappointing for this group because contrary to popular belief, I don't think we're as young as we have been saying for the last two years. Our core of really good players are actually getting on a little bit in terms of they're not youth anymore. Yep. Hartlett, Boak, Schultz, Monfries, Ryder, uh, all these guys are what, 24, 25, 26 minimum? Yep. Schultz is, Schultz is 30 now. And we really, as decent as Shaw and Harvey look, I mean, we're still probably a ways from having another genuine power forward coming through the ranks, guaranteed. So, uh, you know, we've got to make hay while the sun shines. And if we can't get a home home prelim with 55,000 screaming Port Adelaide fans at Adelaide Oval giving us that massive edge that destroyed Richmond, um, you know, it's probably going to be a big disappointment because as as is shown, if you don't get that home prelim, you're at a massive disadvantage to make the grand final. That's right. Absolutely. Well, look, what uh, what improvements do we need to make um, to be able to make a grand final this year? A bit more with the uh, composure, I think. That was probably our, our um, failing in a few games. I think of the Sydney game at the SCG, um, lack of composure to execute, which cost the game there. Um, the same thing happened in, the, obviously, the Hawthorne preliminary final. We uh, we should have really uh, had that on toast in the first quarter, shouldn't we, Macca? We should have, yep. We, we were there Absolutely. and we were crying. Well, you were crying. I was just consoling you. But, um, <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, really, for me, it's composure. As long as the boys keep their focus again, and I, I have no doubt that they will and they won't get ahead of themselves, if they, if they can just fix up that couple of percent they're off in key moments in big games, I think that's the, that would be the difference. Yeah. Look, for me, I think it's got to be our goal kicking. I think we that's one thing that is a definite has to be improved. I think it, it costs us a spot in the grand final and costs us numerous games throughout the year, our goal kicking. It just wasn't good enough in 2014. I think we need to improve our options towards goal and, and where we're kicking it inside 50 as well. And I think we also need to improve our clearance work as well. I'd agree with all of those. I mean, uh, do you think it's more of a wider symptom of our forward uh, forward 50 entries and the way we set up? Or do you think it's just a matter of perhaps we're almost surprised at how many opportunities we're getting going forward and we perhaps snatch at chances as a result? 
I think it's to do with the game plan that we that we try and implement, where we sort of push everyone out of the Ford 50 and have them running back in, um, and that can often lead towards uh, you know some wide entries inside 50, and we're, we're, we're having shots at goal from you know positions which you know could be improved on. I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I finally bit the bullet and I went back and watched some of the prelim after swearing that I wouldn't. And, uh, yeah, from memory, although we butchered some gettable shots, a lot of our shots weren't in flash positions, especially Schultz. No. There was one really <clears throat> bad one that he missed from about 35, 40 metres out that he usually shells from about straight in front. But he got a couple of ones wide. There was another one where Polek got one off a crumb and he was on his wrong foot and he snapped it over his shoulder. Um, oh, yeah, I mean, mm. I guess it's just a matter of, you know, we just... Again, I would personal preference would be the second big target. Like, you know, Hawthorne have got Roughhead, they've got Gunston, who Gunston, I mean, that's ridiculous how cheaply they got him and what he's turned out to be. Yeah. Sydney have got their fifty options. Um, you know, if we've got Schultz and if Schultz isn't shelling them from all angles, then we kind of lack that second genuine target and we're more looking for opportunistic goals. Like, I mean, Gray kicking four goals in the semi final in one quarter. Um which, you know, did a great job up forward, but it robbed us of a midfield option. You know, ultimately, I mean, that's what we've got Paddy Ryder in. It'll give West off a little bit more versatility, but I think we've really got to look at, especially as we are winning the ball out of the centre, we are dominating possession more often than not. We've got to try and get the biggest bang for our buck coming out of the middle. Yeah. Are you classifying West off as a uh, key position forward or not? I think he clearly is. A lot of you people know, say know, that he's not or try and make the case that he's not, but I think he clearly is. So, therefore, um, with Ryder coming into the side, if Westhoff pushes up, does that mean Ryder and Loby become the second key forward or do we do we also so. need to, or do we need to look at maybe putting in a, a Butcher, Shaw or Harvey um, in that forward line as well and drop one of the smalls? Or Well, what does the recruitment of Ryder mean for Butcher, Shaw and Harvey? I mean... Does it put them all under the pump? Does it limit their capability of getting game time? Um, you know, if if all three of those players, um, Schultz, Hoff and Ryder, are all fit, I mean, are they going to actually get a game? I think Shaw and Harvey are definitely... I think they're still in the incubator. I mean, Harvey's clearly a long-term work in progress who's in what? He's going to be in his second, or, second year? Second, second year. year. Yeah, yeah second. second year. I mean, he's a long-term work in progress. I mean, the only knock on him in his junior days was he had absolutely no tank. Yeah. And I remember, you know, going to a training session midway through the year and even after the other guys had stopped and were signing autographs, uh, Burgess was rolling balls at Harvey and getting to pick him up and getting to body out with the right coach. And I, he, Harvey was doubled over. I thought he was going to vomit. And this was when Monfries and Gray were having, you know, Nokia and iPhone selfies with, you know, young girls and, you know, middle-aged mm. men. But you've got, to build, you've got to build his tank up. He's a long-term uh, work in progress. Sure... I don't quite know where he's at. I thought he was tracking better than I think it sounds like he is. But uh, a butcher, I mean, yeah, definitely make or break this year, isn't it? It is. Absolutely, it is. I mean, for me, if Shaw doesn't get games this year, do we see him staying? Depends how plausible it was that he was actually going at the end of last or was tempted to go at the end of last year. I mean, every player is going to look at opportunities and if they're not getting enough, they're going to have to consider their options because I guess... You could flip it and ask the question, how long can Shaw stay on our list without getting enough games before he starts to lose value in his own commodity? Um, So if I was Shaw, uh, I would be hoping I can stack up better numbers than what I did in 2014 as well and influence games for longer with with more impact. And if I can do that and can't get selection at AFL level, well, then I'd I'd be looking to see uh, if I can get a game somewhere else. Freo will come at him. I mean, Gumbleton no didn't pan out. The Gumbleton risk didn't pan out. Pavlich has said he's probably got one year left. Freo will absolutely come at him with something. So yeah. either he breaks through or we look at maybe trading him for what we spent on him, which is, you know, a second-round pick maybe. Another question relating to this is, can we actually squeeze in a third key position forward whilst playing the two rucks, or does that destroy our running game completely? Depends if Butcher's is okay. Yeah. Depends how good runners they are, isn't it? 
Mm. I mean, Butcher, Butcher, when he first came into the side, his chasing was phenomenal. He His ground-level work was phenomenal. I and mean, then I don't know whether it's because of the accumulated injury or the confidence or, you know, the endless discussion on Butcher, but he's gone from being this really dynamic, hard-working key forward to kind of being pigeonholed as that, you know, stay-at-home kind of, you know, big lug who could potentially cost us our running game. So, I mean, hopefully Burgess is working his magic and we see the old Butcher come out, you know? Yeah. Well, supposedly um, his uh, fitness for this preseason is fantastic. Hasn't got, hasn't been injured, has been able to complete all the drills. Um, I was having a chat to Jacko about that on Wednesday and uh, he was very optimistic about how he's completed the pre-season so far compared to previous seasons and Darren said the same thing. So uh, I'm very interested as well to see how John goes because obviously confidence crushed him uh, last year and, and it would be nice to be able to see him turn it around. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I follow all the poor players and I want all the poor players to succeed and I don't like it when I, I see our own supporters sometimes ridiculing our players, so I hope oh, he can no yeah. I hope he can turn it around. No doubt it's unnecessary and you know I'm the same, you know, I want everyone to succeed. I want everyone to be a star and you know, there's gonna be players that don't make it and that's fine, but you know, you, you just gotta put the faith behind these guys. There's something about Butcher though, isn't there? When he can't, when he's, he can't he's just that big key forward that we haven't oh. had since Treadray that you just you know that you've seen from a kid you want you just want him to develop and turn into that star and you know he's always had something about him from the moment we drafted him we drafted him to be Treadray's replacement hasn't worked out yet I think everyone's got their fingers crossed that something does happen there he was the, the other thing too he was the big high profile kid who was going to be the poster child for walking out on Alberton at the end of 2011. And there was that big, you know, I mean, back then we didn't know. We didn't know whether he'd leave. We didn't know whether Loby would leave. Boak, you know, we didn't know whether Geelong would take him. And then Butcher was probably the first one to come out and commit. Mm. I mean, oh, it would just be such a bonus to have Butcher performing, even if he could just get up for, say, 20 to 30 goals and go back to clunking them like his younger days would just be an amazing bonus for the team. Absolutely. And look, I I do think it is probably last chance saloon for Johnny Butcher. I think he might realise this is it as well. I mean, he's out of contract at the end of this year. He does need to show something resembling some sort of AFL form because if he doesn't, there is a big chance he'll be out of the AFL system. Or he just, like, if he doesn't progress from his current state, he just screams Western Bulldogs rookie list that they'll take a punt on another big boy who, Mm. you know, the Andrew McDougals, the Mm. Marty Pasks, who uh, they will potentially... The Matthew Panos. Oh, all of them. All of them. They, you know, and that would be horrible. I think even Butcher would admit he'd rather be back in Mafra at the local milk bar than uh, finding himself at the Western Oval. Than being the next Trent Bartlett. (laughs) Easley Hunter. (laughs) So, do you guys? How think... many hacks have the Western Bulldogs had in their forward line? At least, at least they've given it a go. Yeah, it's true. It's very. But do you reckon um, Michael Voss will make a bit of a uh, difference to our coaching panel and the influence on how we play this year? Well, look, you'd hope so. I mean, that's what he's being paid money for. You'd hope he will bring some sort of experience and you know that sort of success that he had as a player, um, you know, into the club and you know try and offload some of that knowledge onto the playing group for sure. I mean, the reason I asked is because, I mean, he's another player that was in a successful side with three key forwards when you think of Lynch, Bradshaw and Brown. So he's gone through it as well. Um, so it's just interesting to see if it goes back to that argument about the the third key position forward. Um, yeah, I'm interested. And it would be also interesting to see if there's a bit more, or if there can be, hardness in the side from his experience. Yeah. It's the age-old debate, isn't it? Is he the tracksuit coach who, as we've already seen <clears throat> from the uh, pre-season picks, you know, wrestling with Ollie and, you know, getting down and dirty, showing these boys a bit of roughness. Is he a tracksuit coach who will sharpen these guys up in the clinches, toughen them up in the clinches, or is he going to be more of a tactician like Phil Walsh or will he marry a balance between the two? I mean... Will we just see a rougher, tougher version of the current Port Adelaide or will he 
try to instill some sort of additional midfield game plan or stoppage plan. It's going to be interesting to see. It will. I've got to say, um, when the poor boys went to Kersbrook Oval, I uh, I had to do a double take when Ollie Wines came around the corner from his car because I could not believe how massive that kid is. I didn't I didn't realise it was him because his body shape compared to nearly every other midfielder was just amazing. He was almost twice as wide as those boys, and he is going to be a man mountain of a man. And you know to think that he might have Michael Voss so. Uh, Sculpting him a little bit as a as a football player should be pretty scary for other midfield uh, players in the competition. That's can we it. can we put the puppy fat rumor to bed, please? Oh, there's no puppy fat. <laughs> I've, I've seen. I've seen. I've, he is all muscle. I've That's heard cute. Dermot Brereton say it. I saw it on the board. I can't remember who said it. The got the got the kid is just a hundred percent ripped muscle. Yeah, it is ridiculous. It makes me question my very existence. <laughs> what did he say to Kane Corns? What did he send to him in a tweet? Genetically oh, gifted or something? Yes, like that. <laughs> he absolutely is. Goodness, you, it's insane. Hey. Anyway. Look, who's going to be the biggest improver in 2015? And I want two players here. I want someone that's already recognised as first 18 or thereabouts, and I want a young kid pushing through. Hmm. Well, I'm going to go Ollie Whites. I think he's still got a, a big curve in his uh, potential, and I loved. I've, I still think about the the five three quarter time challenge where he won the ball and was just amazing. And I think he's just going to be a beast of a player. And um, I'll pass you over to Triby because I did have someone who's going to be my bolter this year, and it's gone from me. So I'll let Triby cut in so I can think who that was again. Yeah, I think my first 18 breakthrough player is going to be Chad Wingard. He's already been All-Australian. He's already tantalised the world with his marking and goal-kicking ability. But we saw a glimpse in the Frio semi when he kicked that famous goal where he ran 150 metres, got to the contest, Mm -hmm. then sweated off, got the handball from Schultz and then kicked that wonderful goal. I think we're going to see him running higher up the ground. And if he can do that, add to his work rate add to his running power after this preseason. Yes, he's had the knee set back, but, you know, he's already got how many months of a preseason under his belt. Um, gee, if he could rotate through the middle, it could absolutely tip us over the edge in terms of just that raw midfield power. I mean, when Boak or Wines or Ebert runs to the bench, if Wingard begins to rotate through there, I mean, opposition coaches are just going to be defecating buckets at the <laughs> at the sight of Chad Wingard just fixing his hair in the middle of the ground. So mm. here we go. And a young kid pushing through? That's a very good question. There's so many. Well, how many are there? There's 20, 25 you could nominate. Buckalo. Buckalo. It's Carl Amon, um, Mason Shaw, Logan Austin, Look, I like Mitch Harvey. I think if Mitch Harvey, after his second preseason, let's say get four to six weeks at the Magpies under his belt, he's already got the massive kick and the big mark. I could absolutely see him coming in. If he can add to his running power, keeping in mind that he was rucking for the Magpies, if he can add to his running power and perhaps sit deep in the square and rotate in the ruck, I mean, he could potentially, you know, clunk two, three marks a game. And if he can kick two or three goals, then happy days. Then you're laughing. I think Carl Amon's probably the main choice to be a player pushing through. And you mentioned Chad Wingard, and I think Carl Amon would be the perfect player to come in and hopefully do something resembling his role in the forward line because I think he's he's almost like a mini Chad in his playing ability, his skills, his pace. He's got the big mark, the big kick, the X factor, all that sort of thing. So I think he's someone to to look um, out for uh, for 2015. But look, my depth player is going to be Jesse Palmer. I think he's going to improve a lot throughout the year, and I reckon he's going to push for games in the second half of the season. I reckon Jacko Trengo would be another one too, because um, I reckon he's going to be able to really focus now just on his defensive aspect of the game and not have to worry about the ruck at all unless we get serious injuries. So I think he'll uh, he'll take it up a gear too. But uh, the young one that I was thinking of that was all has fallen off the radar is Sammy Cahoon. I reckon he, in the second half of the season, yep. uh, will punch out his running ability because he is a great runner and a gut runner and he's proven that he's got the goods and I reckon he'll be pushing hard to get in the side in the second half of the season. 
Good call. I like he, that one. He has an incredible football brain, Sam Kerr. Yeah. Like, not much was made of him being little, but was he... Uh, am I completely wrong in saying he was under-18 SA captain? Because he was the SA MVP yes, for the under eighteen. That's what he. I mean, but I don't think he was captain. Yeah. yeah, his his ability to read the play and his ability to get into the right spot. Like it was the, the second showdown uh, mm. when he kicked that goal where he turned on a dime and uh, like he just has an insanely good football brain. And yep. if he can get back his running power, clean up his disposal a little bit. And I know that's not the easiest thing because. If everybody could kick at AFL level, they'd all be fabulous with their fitness bases. But um, he could potentially be good for, you know, 20 really intelligent touches. And that's just as a peripheral player. Absolutely. Well, look, I think the club, the supporters, and also the media are all expecting a grand final appearance this year. Do you think our playing group's going to be able to handle that weight of expectation for the first time? I don't think they did this year. Or last year, sorry, if we're being brutally honest. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Yeah, I mean, we were sitting, really sitting in the box seat for a, uh, a grand final appearance. And I think it's fair to say that we probably disappointed ourselves in the second half of 2014. Yep. So, Despite you, the good finals campaign. Do you think they got ahead of themselves? I don't think they got ahead of themselves. I think maybe they just didn't realise they had to push through as hard as what they have to. Maybe they couldn't push through. Maybe they that's, just... That's a possibility as well. Maybe they just weren't physically mature enough to, to push through with the training training workload plus the full season. Because I know what you were saying, Trivi, about the senior players um, hitting their core age, but we still are carrying a lot of uh, underage players as well. So, um, you know, maybe that took an impact. I don't know if they got ahead of themselves. And, look, I mean, all the... From the leadership group, especially within the media, um, you know, they are all reinforcing that if they don't work hard, if they don't train hard, they aren't getting anywhere. So I think they realise that how hard they have to work. And I don't think Darren Burgess or, or Ken Hinckley or any of the other coaches are going to let them get ahead of themselves. So I'd be very, very surprised if they can't handle the weight of expectation. I just think in terms of that big gap between... Our very best, which we know is absolutely top tier elite, to having to respond when the chips are down. I think we still had those moments where, if the opposition had a run on, or if the opposition were playing well and were in the ascendancy, at times we looked really poor. And it took mm. us a while to shake out of that and get back to going, hang on a minute, we can compete, we can absorb these punches. I mean, uh, you know, the Hawthorne prelim, they got five goals up and all of a sudden we decided to, all, you know, fitness was a factor, but it seemed like, all oh, right, the weight of expectations off, you know, Hawthorne slipped back a bit, we got into our groove and then all of a sudden the confidence was like an avalanche and we almost nicked it from them. Mm-hmm. In the Fremantle semi, we looked, you know, dead and gone at stages in the, in the second quarter. And then when we got on top and began to believe, we were absolutely undeniable. I think if we can keep that high level and keep that belief running at all times instead of having to mount these miraculous comebacks every couple of weeks, you know, we could be looking at a 7, 16, 17, 18 win season and a home prelim. Well, you'd hope so. And I mean, I guess I hate going with the cliche games played, you know, the champion data sort of talk. But, I mean, if you look at it, Tom Jonas, Aaron Young, um, Aaron Moore... Uh, Chad Wingard, Ollie Wines, Jared Pollock, um, you know, pitted uh, all under 50 games. So you know there was still we still had a big a big absence of game day experience. So for those clutch moments you're talking about, you know, we, there's a, probably a third of our team that still is probably lacking that experience, especially when you match it up against the juggernaut of say a Hawthorne or a Sydney or a Fremantle. So. I think there was a lot to take out of 2014 and the, there's a lot of lessons I think the players would have learned that they'll be able to carry forward to 2015 and do a little bit better and, and that's why I'm optimistic that we, we will get that home preliminary final that you're uh, asking for. Yep. Well look, let's put it all on the line. I want a ladder prediction for Port Adelaide in 2015. Whereabouts are we going to finish? I'll go second. I think we'll finish second on the ladder. I think okay. Haw- Hawthorne will 
be tough again. Uh, you know, they're a great club, great juggernaut, um, you know, with their easy draw that we just spoke about before in the beginning. So, um, yeah, I think it's our spot there to be taken. Yeah, I think if we can get through that first five weeks relatively unscathed, both in terms of the win-loss record and injuries, then it could really open up. And with that extra preseason under the belt, the extra experience you speak of, Rick, uh, potentially we could really steam home and go on with it. So I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say the minor premiership, the McClelland, the, the hallowed McClelland trophy. Oh, we got the, enough of those. The gold Logie of the Australian Football League <laughs> is coming back to Alberton for a fourth time. Boys? Bring it on. I'm excited. You better be. What are I'm you reckon, I think we are going to finish fourth at the end of the minor round. Yep. I think, I'm hoping that we are at least three and two in that first five-week period. And then, as we said, the draw opens up from there, and hopefully we can get a bit of a run on and, and get some some good wins going from there. But I think we'll finish around about fourth, um, and I think we'll win our first final this year away from home, and we'll make our way to the grand final. So who are the two games we're going to lose in that three and two? I think probably Frio away, and I think maybe Sydney as well. The perennial slow starters? Yep. So what do you reckon, Trivi? What do you think we're going to be after the first five games? I'll put you on the spot there quickly. We'll, uh, we'll put this in the, the record books for the season. Look, I just said we're going to win the minor premiership, but that, in all reality, <clears throat> I think I prefer worst-case scenarios so I don't get my hopes up and my little heart broken. So <laughs> I'm going to say we're going to be pushing a little bit of poo uphill after that first five weeks. I think we're going to be two and three. All right. I think we're going to lose. Oh, that's that's doable. I think we're going to lose to Frio. I think we're going to come back and beat Sydney. I think Sydney are a done entity. I've had enough of Sydney. I think we're going to lose to North Melbourne in Melbourne because that is what happens unless it's a final. Um, mm-hmm. I think we're potentially going to lose to Hawthorne, and I think our players are going to right the wrong of the horrendous away showdown last year, and I think. Phil Walsh and his men are not going to know what hit them in that first showdown next year, or this year, sorry. I hope so. Well, look, we'll leave it there for now. 2015 has begun on the podcast. We're going to follow the same script from last year in the fact that we'll be doing one podcast a week pre- and post-season, and we'll go with two during the week again throughout the season to preview and review the games uh, throughout the year. Look, hopefully we can provide Port fans with some exclusive uh, club content as well throughout the season. Oh, we'll be uh, we'll be providing a fair bit, I reckon, this year, Macca. It should be good. Mm, Always a pleasure. I hope so. And we've got that little secret up our sleeve that we won't disclose just yet. So, we'll, is we'll the can I can I guess at what the secret is? No, you can. No, I can't. No, no, I'm, I'm going to guess. Yeah. Is are you going to like? So he's like El Scorcho going to come on as Jacob Surgeon, but as <laughs> the Port Insider. <laughs> I have never heard. <laughs> he's not even trying to do an impersonation, and he sounds exactly like him. Oh, El Scorcho. We love you, El Scorcho. We do. He's a legend. Whether he is back as Jacob Surgeon or not, you've got you the, have to find out. You've got the guess in one. Well done, man. How do you know? <laughs> <laughs> All right, boys. Until next time. Adios. Count the power. Go the power. Go the power. Wines, Gray, fancy, well done. Still Gray, handball's good. West off, could kick a goal from here. He does. What a start. 